Welcome to Jesus Experience. You are designed to receive from God the life of His Son, Jesus Christ. And through the life of Christ in you, you will live and affect the world around you. Now, here is Dr. Gary V. Whetstone. All of His glory, power, and majesty this morning as we're in our 11 o'clock service. Father, we thank You for supernatural grace and wisdom and authority and power that rules us. God, open our eyes today as we open your word to see you alive in resurrection power. We give you praise and glory, fathers. We're able to come openly, boldly before your throne in our parking lot service and magnify you in the name that's above every name, Jesus. Amen. Well, Toby's going to come and lead us in worship. Come on and bless the Lord. Amen. Let's just sing the song while you're in the car together. Let's just sing. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he owns my future. And life is worth a living just because he lived. Let's sing it one more time. Say, because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he owns my future, and life is worth a living just, and life is worth a living just, and life is worth a living just. Because he lives. Can I get you all to celebrate this morning? Because he lives, you can face tomorrow. He is the reason. He is alive. And well, he's on the throne. And because he's on the throne, he is well. Hallelujah. Let's celebrate Jesus this morning. Let's celebrate Jesus this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want you to rejoice wherever you are. Come on, as we celebrate. Say. Celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. Come on, celebrate. Celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. You got to rejoice wherever you are. Come on, say. Celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. Hallelujah. Celebrate. Celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. He is risen. He is
here this morning say celebrate, celebrate. Jesus celebrate that's what we've come to alive forevermore. Amen. Now this morning we have some very special things going on this morning and I want you to pay attention to your bulletin. First, we're going to ask everybody to make sure that you go on to your phone and go on to our, our community phone call. We can handle several hundred phone calls together at once. Now this only works for the parking lot because online, I'm sorry, but there's a delay, and by the time it gets, it's kind of all over the place. So only for those in the parking lot. We want you to dial the number that's on your uh, bulletin. Right below it says attend parking lot services every Sunday. So that number, then put it on mute for right now so that when we make our declarations together, we can all hear together each one as we're declaring the Word of God and sharing the authority of a believer, and ruling the atmosphere we're in. So let's pray together and thank God for supernatural revelation. God, today is like no other day, the day of celebration of your resurrection. Father, we step over the threshold today of experience in the power of resurrection life. God, today as we break this 11th hour of the day open, we reckon that you're not only alive from the dead, but you're alive in us in power. So, Father, open our eyes of our understanding. Give to us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you. In the name that's above every name, Jesus. Amen. Now, this morning, as we go into the Word of God, I want you to take out your bulletin, and you have a, an outline there in your bulletin. And those of you online, download the outline because it'll help you. Because what we're doing is we're sharing the Word of God. He's the Word made flesh who dwelt among us. We beheld Him, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And He, the Son of Man, was crucified on Friday, buried, descended into hell, took captivity captive, gave gifts unto men, the fivefold ministry gifts, and He took the keys of hell, death, and the grave. And this morning, as our text, as we talk about Jesus' resurrection conquers all, Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says, But Jesus commended his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, much more than being now justified by his blood, shall we be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled shall we be saved by his life. Resurrection is about much more than what he died to end. And what we know he died to end was supernatural. He died to end the rule of sin over your life. 
diseases. He was bore our sicknesses and carried our pains. We esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He became sin, the curse of the law. He became the law. He crucified the world to you and you to the world. He crucified you and all others. And that sacrifice ended humanity as we know it, but much more resurrection began life that we could never have without Jesus living his life through us. In Romans chapter 8, verse 34, it says, Who is he that condemns? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Now, intercession means that Jesus is standing before the Father for every single one of us for the prophetic purpose, the call of God on our life to be manifested. And everything the enemy is against us, he stands against by the power of his blood and through his resurrection authority. As we look at the account of Jesus' resurrection in our morning services at 6 a.m., we covered extensively how Jesus was revealed to the women that came to the tomb. But today, as we go into resurrection understanding, I want to begin at the end of the day where Jesus reveals himself to his disciples because they did not believe the women. They did not believe Mary. They did not believe Salome. They did not believe any of the women. They did not believe even those that were on the road to Emmaus and came back and shared that they met Jesus on that road. They didn't believe. These 11 disciples, in their unbelief, hear and experience Jesus in John chapter 20, verse 19. Because they believe somebody stole Jesus. That was their belief, that somebody took the body and we don't know where he is. They did not believe he rose from the dead. And he had to prove himself alive. And if he could prove himself alive to unbelieving disciples, how much more does he prove himself alive to us today? John chapter 20, verse 19, it says, Then the same day, that resurrection Sunday, at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled together for fear of the Jews, that sounds like us today, all assembled together in our houses, not able to go into many of our workplaces, but yet Jesus came and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. Jesus got to where they were, even though they could not get to where he was. And what's interesting is he gets to us where we are, right where we live, whether it's in unbelief, whether it's in confusion or doubt or uncertainty. We have a risen Savior that knows how to reach us right where we are. And it says, and when he had said so, he showed them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. You see, hearing his voice wasn't enough to prove that he was risen from the dead. We know the story about Thomas, but Jesus showed himself to the other ten. Thomas was not there at the time and proved to them by showing his nail prints in his hands, his feet. And then it says in one translation, and they separated his side. They literally put their hand in the side of his flesh where the sword pierced him. And they were glad because the proof of resurrection came from Jesus, did not come from them. And that is critical for us to believe because everything that we have in God came from God to us, not from us to God. And as he said this, and when he had thus said, he breathed on them, verse 22, and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. Now Jesus had already gone to the throne of God. He presented his blood and purged heaven from the knowledge of sin. He threw the enemy out so he had no longer right to accuse you before your God. We'll read these a little bit later in the scripture. 
And as we go into this understanding, this day of resurrection is power. It is not just a belief that God raised his son. It is the power of God living through you to release humanity from every ill and destruction assigned against them. Then it says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, when we understand what happened in resurrection, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The day that God raised Jesus from the dead is the day you received your born-again experience. You say, but I didn't receive my born-again experience until I was 25 or I was 14 or whatever age. But I want you to know that when he raised Jesus from the dead is when you were ex given the right of a born-again experience. And that experience is critical for us to understand because as we make our proclamations today, we're going to see whose we are and who he is in us. We are raised up together with him. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4, it says, God, who is rich in his mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, he hath quickened us together, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you are saved and has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, that's where we're at right now. 2020 is an age to come. He might show, display the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. For by grace you're saved through faith, that not of yourself, it is a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship. Listen to this carefully. We're the masterpiece of resurrection. We're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works that God has before ordained that we should walk in them. You and I in resurrection have works ordained that you and I walk in. We have a good God who has a plan for every one of our lives of whom he raised his son to be the intercessor, to stand on behalf of all that he called in your life. In order to fulfill everything he said about you, he had to make you righteous. He had to make you so you could be in the presence of God without inferiority, without guilt. So as we read in Romans chapter 4, verse 25, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Just as if I had never sinned, his resurrection, his blood on the mercy seat is a proclamation of heaven that you and I stand in his presence, holy, unblameable in his sight. And it says in verse 21 of Colossians chapter 1, it says in you that were sometime alien, and enemies in your mind by wicked works. Yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh. Oh, listen carefully. To present you. So in death, he removed you from all ill of humanity, all curse of the law, all poverty, every assignment of destruction against you. In resurrection, he presented you holy, unblameable, unreprovable in his sight. Romans chapter 9, verse 9 and 10, Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, rather, says that with our heart, man believes, resulting in right standing with God, and with our mouth, our proclamation is made, resulting in salvation. So it's critical that we understand that we are more than conquerors through his resurrected life living through us. Romans chapter 8, as we go on, we're going to look towards the end. It says in verse 37, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
In order to understand this dynamic of resurrection life, we need to know that grace, God's riches at Christ's expense, the grace gifts, the gifts of the Spirit of God, the supernatural endowment of God's Holy Spirit operating in your life came by resurrection and ascension. And in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says, But God, commending his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more. Everybody say with me, much more. That's right. There's much more. Now that we're declared righteous by his blood, shall we be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more. Being reconciled, shall we be saved by his life? You see, this resurrection is so critical for you to fully engage because it's not just that you believe on Easter that he raised from the dead. It's that you have much more from resurrection than anything that he fulfilled in his sacrifice because he designed you to live life and life more abundantly. It's interesting in Revelation chapter 1 when John had the revelation of Jesus on the island of Patmos. In verse 17, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that lives and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and of death. I want you to hear carefully and clearly. On the second day when Jesus descended into hell, he took captivity that were held in Abraham's bosom all the way back to Adam. When Cain killed Abel and the blood of righteous Abel spoke, he was held in Abraham's bosom from that time until Jesus descended and led them out of their captivity into the throne of God. Jesus also went to the enemy and he said, give me those keys, they belong to me. He took the keys of hell and of death. He said, death, you'll not have power over man. As a matter of fact, I want you to know, you are eternal life. You who have received the Lamb of God, for as many as received him, to them gave he the power to be called, to become the sons of God. That experience made you eternal. And death can't kill you. Because he who lives in you holds the keys of hell and of death. What a victory. You're also called into the fellowship of his son. Now this is where you and I join together with him, the high priest of our profession. I want you to understand something about Jesus. And that is, he's just not sitting on the throne of heaven waiting until he returns. He is ever living to make intercession for you to save you to the highest. He's also the high priest of your profession, the proclamation of your faith. He takes what you speak that he said about you, and he brings it into manifestation. In 1 John chapter 1, we look over here in verse 1. It says, that which is from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon in our hands of handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we've seen it, and we bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. Now this is the key, that you may also have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write unto you that your joy may be full. Now, fellowship is not having chicken dinner with each other. Fellowship is being joined together in common purpose and united in union. And so our fellowship is with Jesus risen from the dead. Our fellowship is with our Father who filled us with the power of the Holy Spirit. 
Our fellowship is together with God that we speak in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. Everything that's unlawful, everything that's out of sync, everything that's out of order, God rectified in his resurrection of his son and you, so you, his ambassador on earth, speak as the oracle of God. So today, I'm going to ask you to take your phone off of mute because we're going to hear together the body of Christ speak together the word of God because you and I are the mouthpiece of the living God. This is the temple of God. You and I are the body of Christ. So this makes this the finger of God. These make these the feet of God. The feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In 1 John chapter 1, as it's talking about fellowship, we are called to proclaim his word and his utterance in our spirit. We're also, as we proclaim, we bring to manifestation what he says. If I'm going to pray for the sick, I'm declaring in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, by your stripes they were healed. We speak and he sends forth his word and heals them. If there's any sick among you, today is your day of healing. Today, the word of God in our mouth is yes and amen and manifest exactly what God speaks. And all manifestation is for multiplication. So let's look at some of these understandings because if we understand the word of God clearly, we can engage him and see the results that he's ordained to manifest on the earth. 2 Corinthians 4.13, it says, And we having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. So we're going to boldly declare together. This is your first declaration. You ready? One, two, go. I win every conflict through the confidence I have in Christ Jesus. That's a bold proclamation, that I win every conflict through the confidence I have in Christ Jesus. Now, we'll see how that unfolds today as we make declaration after declaration, because this is a spiritual law that governs the Word of God. As you and I are governed by the human functionality of our body, Faith is a governing fact of the rule of our heart and our mouth. It says, as God revealed to Joshua, as he had to take the children out of the, well, they were in the wilderness for 40 years, the second generation after Moses' death, Joshua had to take them in to the promised land. They won victory after victory after victory. But this is how they did it. In verse 8, of Joshua chapter 1. It says, This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein. You'll speak it over and over and over again, day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. So how does the fulfillment of the word of God come? It comes by speaking. It comes by speaking. It comes by speaking. So today, we're going to make proclamations together, declarations of the rule and authority of his resurrection. We're going to declare to the principalities of the air. We're going to declare to sin and its nature. We're going to declare to ourselves. We're going to declare to our future because God put his word in our heart and in our mouth, the word of faith which we proclaim. Then in Luke chapter 11, verse 20, we get an insight of how to win this war against the enemy. It says in verse 20, but if I with the finger of God cast out demons or devils, no doubt the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man armed keeps his palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him, and overcome him, he takes from him all of his armor wherein he trusted and divides his spoils. Now, I want you to hear carefully. There are confidences that are on television. There are confidences in your family. There are confidences in your body. 
There's confidences in your mind that the enemy is using to bring you to bondage, to hold you into limitation, to hold you in frustration, to hold you into an intimidation rather than the bold affirmation of being able to move and do the exploits God's called you to. I want to pray for you. I believe this is a supernatural time in God to open your eyes to see the grace of God that's in your life, the power of the Word of God that's in your mouth, the authority you have in resurrection life. Father, I thank you for supernatural grace that breaks through every barrier that is alive in their hearts and minds. God, I pray today, as we look unto you whom they pierced, they look to you, Jesus, who is alive from the dead and now living in them in power. God, I thank you that every principality, power, might, dominion, every name that is named, hears the life, hears the word, and sees transformation manifest in the name that's above every name, Jesus. Amen. Now as we look in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, as you take your phone off of mute now, we're going to make these declarations together from the first bullet point all the way down to the, to the last. And when I say one, two, go, make a declaration together. Make sure you've downloaded this online so you know the declarations we're making. It says in Galatians 2, verse 20, one, two, go. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, say it with me, but Christ lives in me. And the life I live, now listen, which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. Do you know that when you speak about what you're able to do, what you're capable of achieving, what you want to do, there's a frustration in the grace of God. When you speak, he that is in me is almighty. There's no limitation. There's no inhibition. There's no equal to him. He has no restraint. I don't frustrate, I don't scramble, I don't restrain, I don't intimidate, I don't hinder the grace of God. How do you do it? It's by saying and proclaiming, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life I live in this flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now we're going to make our second declaration. One to go, sin in all of its deception working against me, was crucified, and I reckon I am dead to sin in my life. The reason is Romans chapter 6, verse 11. Let's read it out loud together. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Christ Jesus our Lord. So when I say sin is crucified in me, I'm not saying I have power over sin. I'm saying the death of Jesus, he was made sin. It was crucified. So I declare in agreement with him, the nature of sin in me is dead. And I agree with his sacrifice, it's dead in me. You say, but I don't feel it. I don't sense, I feel like I always miss it. I come up short. Then you speak the word of God until revelation takes you over. And once revelation takes over in your life, you will experience life in the Spirit of God that you've never known you could walk in because meditation brings revelation. I encourage you with all that is within me to speak this Word of God over and over and over again till it becomes so revealed in you that you experience. Let's go to the next bullet point. One, two, go. I acknowledge that sin in every form and through any everyone was crucified in Jesus' death. The reason is 2 Corinthians 5.14. For the love of Christ constrains, rules, governs my life because we thus judge. One died for all, therefore all were dead. How can you say that? Now, wouldn't that be an atrocity to say I judge my wife crucified to me? Wouldn't it be 
just an error to say, I judge my child was crucified and therefore their life in the flesh has no power over them. No, that's what he did. He took them into death so their life is ruled by the nature of Christ, not by their humanity. So when I say it, I engage the authority of him who paid for it all. I want you to go to the next point. One, two, go. The blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purged my conscience from dead works to serve the living God. That proclamation speaks to your conscience. Conscience, you're not aware of dead works. You're not aware of the faltering and sin and error of my own life and others. You're aware of one, the living God. Conscience, you're aware of the living God. The blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. Purge conscience. Purge. Free. Yes, that's your portion. That's your walk. That's what he did in resurrection. Next point. One to go. Say it out loud. Since Jesus was made sin for me, I stand in God's presence righteous, without inferiority, guilt, shame, or blame, to live as if sin never existed. You say, but I, I still have this guilt in my life. I, I still feel the blame. I still feel the shame. As you declare the word of God, that yoke of deception and lie breaks off your life because 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians 5:21 says for he the father hath made him the son to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him now this is where we make our next declaration one to go in the body of his flesh through death to present you me holy unblameable unreprovable in his sight. Do you know that he does not know you after what you do or say? He knows you after what he did and what he said. And when he hears you say what he did, that I stand in your presence, Father, without inferiority, without guilt, without shame, without blame, I stand holy, unblameable in your presence. You say, but that's pretty arrogant to say that you're in God's presence. It's not what I did. It's what he did. That's what we're celebrating today, resurrection. And when resurrection is declared, much more grace is manifested. The next one, let's go. One, two, go. In the name of Jesus and through the person of Jesus, I forgive everyone for everything that has been said or done against me or my family. I remit their sin and release them from all penalty and offense. Why? Because when Jesus revealed himself to his disciples in John chapter 20, verse 23, he said, whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. How many of you have ever heard in your family the offense of somebody else in a family that did something, said something, and therefore it traveled into someone else in the family and it became a harbored, borrowed hurt, a root of bitterness springing up, defiling many. It's the work of the enemy. And the way we break it is we speak and command it forth. That's why 2 Corinthians 2 verse 10 is so critical. Let's read it out loud together. To whom you forgive anything... I forgive also, for if I forgive anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ, lest Satan should get advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. That tells me that if I forgive anybody, you get benefit. If I retain the error of somebody, you become restricted. I cannot afford 
to hold anything against anybody for any reason at any point because Jesus paid for it all and the enemy is the one who wants it to be retained in my mind and therefore I remit the sin, I release the person so Satan does not get advantage of you. And if you take that same authority, you make that same declaration, you will find your heart freed, your conscience released from offense. That's our next statement. One to go. I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. You know, it's interesting that we live in a time where they call these things acts of God. There is no offense towards God and towards man. You keep your conscience freed by speaking the word of God. One, two, go for the next point. I refuse to listen to any accusation against me or anyone else. All accusation, guilt, shame, blame, suspicion, release my life in Jesus' name. Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. Let's read it out loud together. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him, the devil, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. That's what we're doing today. We're taking our testimony and we're breaking the bands of the enemy. And they love not their lives unto the death. Every time you speak the word of God, you break through the principalities of the air. That's our next point. So I want you to say it with me. One, two, go. I speak to every principality and power of the enemy. You are under my feet and have no authority over my life, purpose, health, finances, family, and future in Jesus' name. Why? Because we have the same intent to speak to the principalities and powers of the air. Then you make a declaration about your being. Our next point, one to go. I am a new creature in Christ Jesus. Everything is now new and of God in my life. Nothing from the past, present, or future can stop that which God has called into being in my life. Do you know that you're the called of God? So because old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new, and all things are of God who hath reconciled us unto him. We are in such a place of, and just like our parking lot service is new. If we hadn't received the thought, if we didn't have the access to communicate, you wouldn't be here today. It's new. I want you to thank God for new. Go ahead and blow your horn and thank God for new. We bless you. We bless you. You know, that's new. We've never done this before. And now we can reach not only thousands on the internet, but hundreds of cars coming on this Resurrection Sunday celebrating the King of Glory. And then it says, let's start again. In our next one, one, two, go. I am strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Let's read the next one, one, two, go. The Lord teaches me to profit and leads me in the way in which I should go. Do you know that this is the greatest transference of wealth in the history of man is happening right here, right now? You are in it to win it. God has given us in this moment of time a transference of wealth we've never seen before. You say, but everything's shut down. Every time things have shut down, God has always given me creative ideas, supernatural ways of seeing wealth manifest. And that's what it says in the next scripture we're going to say. One, two, go. I remember the Lord my God, for it is he that gives me power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant. And that's what he's given to you, power to get wealth. Make that proclamation. Then the next one, one, two, go. I am the head and not the tail, above only and not beneath. The next one, one, two, go. God's portion of all my income is blessed. My vows, my offerings are blessed. For the last 40-some years of our marriage, together we've tithed, given offerings, we've given houses and cars and lands and blessed. And as we do that, 
Something supernatural happens as I speak. Lord, remember my tithes. Remember my vows. Remember my offerings. Remember my sacrifices. Why? Because we're the Lord's remembrancers. He wants us to speak as he is receiving from my hands what is worship in his. Now, I want you to say this next statement because it's relative to this time. There's many people talking about negativity, but I've got good news for you. Are you ready? One, two, go. My path grows brighter and brighter every day. Why? As we declare together Proverbs 4 and 18. But the path of the just is as a bright and shining light, shines brighter and brighter, more unto the perfect day. Then as we make our next statement, this is about your next steps. It says, one, two, go. I am willing and obedient, so I eat the good of the land. Why? Because Philippians 2.13, he's alive from the dead. He's living through me. It says, for it is Christ with works in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Then finally, as we make this declaration, it says, I am one, two, go. You ready? I am surrounded with favor as a shield. Prejudice and rejection have no part in my life. You say, but it's not what I experience. It's what I say, and what I say brings manifestation. I can change the hearts of anybody by how I speak about them. I can speak, I can pray, I can loose them, I can declare, I engage favor in their life, and all of a sudden their heart turns. There's a supernatural word of God in your heart, in your mouth. So I want us to do what it says to do. Clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Let's just celebrate the King of glory and thank God for resurrection life. Blow your horns. Shout unto the Lord. Bless him. We bless you, Lamb of God. Your great grace prevails. We bless. God, we thank you for supernatural abundance. God, we bless you. You know, today is a day of victory, not a day of defeat. A day where you walk and you drive out from this service in triumph. If you're in your living room, don't ever look back. Look forward. That's how you're designed. You're designed to go forward and do the exploits of God. And today, as we worship the living God with our first fruits, our tithes, our offerings, our love gifts, we have this awesome, I, I've never in my life, and I, I'm 67 now, I'll have a few more years to go till I hit 120, but I've never seen the government ever just give me money. And so they're giving $1,200 to every adult. Well, God's giving seed to the sower. Maybe you've never tithed in your life. This may be the first time you've ever trusted God because you couldn't figure out how to make it work with what you have. Well, now God's given you what you never had. So he's giving seed to the sower, bread to the eater. So trust God. Bless the Lord. On this Resurrection Sunday, we're going to take our tithes, our offerings, our love gifts, our vows, and here men that die receive tithes. But because he's alive, he receives them. So if you're using your push pay on your phone, if you're online, there's a button there. If you're here in the service, you can use the envelope. Let's pray together and bless the Lord with our giving. Father, I, th I thank you for supernatural seed that goes into supernatural harvest. Father, I thank you that you open heaven in this day in celebration of your glory and receive from our hands what's worship in yours. We give you praise, Father, in the name that's above every name, Jesus. Amen. Bless the Lord as you give. Well, let me give, confirm, success. Praise God, my gift was successful.